Amen. Well, tonight I want to cover a familiar passage, the parable of the ten virgins, as we're talking about cultivating what the oil of intimacy with the bridegroom God. The oil of intimacy is, is a phrase that I've used over the years, and I, I, I like that phrase because that's what the parable is about, getting oil. But before we look at that, I want to give you just a quick snapshot of the larger context. Because Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is one message. And the parable of the, of the ten virgins is, is towards the end of that message. And if you jump in at the end, you miss so many of the details of that parable if you don't catch the context. Now, most of you know Matthew 24 and 25 is Jesus' primary teaching on the end times. He gives more information there than any other place. And again, to grasp the flow of it, we, get the, we, we understand the parable far better. Paragraph A, Jesus identified a few signs of the times. Then he taught four parables of how he wants his people to respond to those signs of the times. Matthew chapter, I mean, paragraph B. Matthew 24 and 25 was his final public teaching, or his final teaching, before he went to the upper room in the Last Supper. So think of the significance of this passage. It's his final teaching before the Last Supper. And in it, he reveals himself as bridegroom, king, and judge. We've gone over that a bunch of times over the, over the weeks. He's a, a king with power, but a bridegroom with desire, desire for a relationship, but he's a judge with zeal, zeal to confront and remove everything that hinders love. It's significant that that was Jesus' final presentation of himself before the upper room, bridegroom, king, and judge. And look at the end of paragraph B. The final presentation of Jesus in the scripture, book of Revelation, last four chapters, it's the same, bridegroom, king, and judge. And so this isn't a small idea. This is a very significant that in our thinking that we don't separate these dimensions of him, but we see them as one reality of, of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Paragraph C, just keep this in mind, and most of you know it well, that in the end times and the generation the Lord returns, it will be the greatest revival and the greatest pressure. It won't be one or the other. It will be both of them operating at the same time across the earth. The greatest revival as well as the greatest pressure. And so in Matthew chapter 24 here, Jesus highlights the resistance. And the resistance is real. It's gonna, there's never going to be a time where the body of Christ is more resisted than the time of the greatest revival. They go together. So paragraph D, it will be the most difficult time, but it will be the most glorious time and the most significant three and a half years of human history. Look what it says in verse 21. It will be a tribulation. It will be trouble. Never seen at that level in human history. But after it, the Son of Man will appear in the clouds and he'll gather all of his people to himself. But where Jesus is taking this teaching, because he knows in Matthew 24, the parables he's going to teach in just a moment. And what he's going to be saying is that you're going to need oil. And oil isn't just, you know, to help our personal quiet time with the Lord. I mean, it is, and I don't want to say just, but this teaching of getting oil is in a far bigger and more serious context than just having a little bit more lively devotional time. Although that to me is in itself is a grand thing, is it in itself. But what he's saying is, my beloved people, you're not gonna be able to thrive in the greatest revival and the greatest pressure without this oil. It's not just something that will be helpful, it will be an issue of life and death. Paragraph Roman numeral two. 
Well, he gave the signs of the times first in Matthew 24. Then he gives four parables. Now, I'm just going to give you a minute on each one because I want you to see the context. But here, I want to say this. These four parables, they are four prophetic Holy Spirit emphasis in the, in the end time church. Don't read these parables and go, oh, that's neat. These parables will be a Holy Spirit emphasis globally to the body of Christ. So if you want a relevant ministry and you're alive in that hour of history, and I think we're in the early days of, of that generation, but if you want a relevant ministry and a message in that hour of history, go after these four parables because they're not random teachings. Jesus says these four will be relevant Holy Spirit emphasis and anointed messages in that hour of history. Well, the first parable, A, it's the parable of the fig tree. And we're not gonna read it, but in this parable, he's really saying the signs of the times that I just gave you, because he gave 22 of them, actually. He says you, you, need to, you need to take time to understand them and recognize them. That's what that parable means. Then he warned the people. Of course, it's just his apostles there. He warns them with a very sober warning. He goes, you really need to know the signs. And he warns them. He says, but most people won't take time to learn them. That's an alarming, sober warning. So the parable of the fig tree, that will be a major Holy Spirit emphasis in the generation the Lord returns. But at the end of that parable, verse 42, he gave what is the most emphasized exhortation Jesus gave to the end time church. You know, I, if you step back and think about it, you say, he knows the depth of the glory, and he knows the depth of the trouble that's coming in that hour of history. If he knows all of this so clearly, what would he say to his people to prepare them? And it's remarkable in its simplicity because the exhortation he gave the most, I mean, by far the most to the end time church is this simple word, watch, or he says, watch and pray. You know, I've thought a few times, Lord, surely there's more you could add to this. And it's like he's saying, you do the watching and praying, and you'll be positioned, positioned in a right place to thrive under the pressure that's coming and to be a useful, relevant participant in the great end-time revival. He says in verse 42, watch. Then verse 43, he talks about the thief. And what this means, again, I don't want to break down all these parables. He's saying to believers, if you don't watch, there's a, 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 a the, you're in a vulnerable place of suffering loss. Because the thief isn't just the one that comes suddenly. That's part of the, of the imagery of the thief. But a thief is one that comes and causes you to suffer loss. And when he talks about watch because of the thief dynamic, he means, yeah, it will be sudden, but yeah, many people, my own people will suffer loss because they won't be ready in that day. Look at verse 44. Verse 44, now again, he's ending the parable of the fig tree. This is one of the most significant statements. He goes, if you do watch, you will be ready. Now, we look at that and they go, that's, you know, we want to be ready. This is the number one focus of the church in that generation is to be ready, according to Jesus. Because it's like Jesus is reaching forward 2,000 plus years because at the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the billions of believers are gathered together, there's one description, they were ready. Jesus is using the same exact word, reaching into the future, the same idea, and he's saying you want to be part of that group. When I look across the nations right now, the church has, and I, I don't say this in a uh, uh, despairing or 
a critical way, but just being sober, there is such a Laodicean spirit of superficiality on the church right now. And I look at that as a shepherd in the body, and I go, Lord, the greatest revival in history is going to reach all nations, but it's not just great in its numbers. It's going to be the greatest revival in history in its spiritual depth because it's going to have a billion-plus believers ready, fulfilling what he says here in verse 44. Right now, I mean, it's not ready to be saved. That's not what we're talking about because there'll be a lot of people are ready to die and be saved and make it to heaven. That's not what it means. Being ready means being in a, uh, uh, a relationship of mutual response of wholehearted love to the Lord. That's what he means by being ready. Not talking about being saved when you die, so praise God, I guess I was ready, I was still saved. No, he's talking about something far greater than that. He's talking about there's going to be one generation of time where it will be the, the revival of the largest magnitude. It will reach every nation of the world. That's never happened. So it will be a unique revival in that way, but it will be unique in another way because all the great revivals of history that I'm aware of, they led people to Jesus but mostly didn't take them into great depth. Like a million got saved, but 10 years later, the million were not spiritually deep in any way that was recognizable in history. But the great revival, it's a bridegroom revival. It's not just a revival where a million or a billion will get saved. That will happen, but they will enter into the revelation of the bridegroom God. And in that, they will see themselves differently and the readiness is the wholehearted mutual love between the body, the bride, and the bridegroom. And so Jesus is looking ahead, and he goes, being ready is the paramount issue. And this idea of the oil is connected to this great revival. Because remember, it's not just a billion souls coming in. They're going to come into a spiritual depth that no revival has ever seen in history. And that's a new idea because it's not just a salvation revival, it's a what I call a bridegroom revival. The bridegroom will be revealed in it, and it will make that revival completely unique from any other revival in history. Paragraph B in Luke chapter 21. Now understand this, that the Matthew 24, 25 message, that sermon, that message, Matthew, Luke 21 is, is Luke's version of it. So it's the same message, but Luke adds a point or two that Matthew doesn't have. It's the same sermon, the same occasion. And Luke talks about the necessity of watching and praying because people's, look at verse 34, their hearts will be weighed down. But he's talking about believers now. Believers all over the earth, they will be confronted with problems with temptations, with persecutions, where Jesus said, the weighing down of your heart will be one of the great concerns. Therefore, watch and pray. Many will be weighed down with fears, others with loss, others with dullness. And he says, watch and pray so you can escape, not meaning, he's not talking about escaping the idea of facing the pressure, but you won't be held captive to the pressure. The pressure won't trap you, and the pressure won't bring you down, and you won't be weighed down by the pressure. You'll escape being snared by the pressures of the earth. But he comes back to the idea of watch and wait. Top of page two. Now again, the reason I'm laying this foundation because the parable of the 10 virgins is a call to watch and wait. But if you take it out of its larger context, you think he's only talking about having a little bit more lively personal prayer time a couple times a week. And he's talking about something far more dramatic and far more urgent than that when you see the parable in its context. Paragraph C. He says, watch and pray. Those are the two words he uses in this end time message. Now, to watch means the, the exhortation is to inform your mind. You're actually to watch the signs of the times unfolding. You're actually to watch them. That's what it, watch means watch. 
And pray is to engage your heart. So he said the two things you need to do, inform your mind and engage your heart. Paragraph one, now watching, they're watching the 22 signs of the times. They're familiar with them and they're asking the Holy Spirit for kind of uh, updated information as the clock moves forward, as the urgency increases, they're acclimating to the situation that's before them. The great revival's mounting up and the pressure's mounting up and they're realigning and acclimating little by little because that's the most effective way to acclimate. So watch. Be an anointed observer and don't be shocked by the sudden greatness of the power in the church or the sudden greatness of the pressure and the temptations in the culture. Don't be shocked by either, but be kind of moving forward, adjusting and realigning to the new uh, evolving situation in the globe and in the church. Then when he says pray, he's not talking so much about growing and understanding, but he's talking about growing right now. Of course, prayer does help your understanding. Growing in strength, your heart engaging with the Lord. Well, the second parable, what he says in this one, this is going to be a big Holy Spirit emphasis. He said there's going to be two types of leaders who confess Christ. There's going to be those that are wise and the others that are captured by disappointment and bitterness, and they show themselves to be evil. They were not evil in the moment. They progressed with negative responses over time. That's a big emphasis of the Spirit. We're not going to look at that, but I just want you to see that there was the wise among people that confessed to follow Christ. There's going to be a company that will be exposed as a, a, of, of a negative heart responses because the bitterness will bring them over the years to a negative response they couldn't have imagined. So Jesus is warning them of that. But they were true believers on the front end. Paragraph E. Then the third parable is the one we're looking at tonight, which is the, the context he's telling the wise ones, it's not enough just to choose good and avoid the bitterness. Now that you're wise, you got to keep a heart connect with me, not just avoid the stumbling block of bitterness and disappointment of the, of the parable just before this. He goes, no, you got to do more than that because people with a good heart that choose to stay free of the bitterness, if they don't stay connected to me, they still will suffer loss. That's the parable we're on tonight. And then the fourth parable, the real message of them, of this parable, is the ability to see the value of our ministry and labors when they're small and difficult. Because the enemy always wants to come and tell us when our labors are small, the fruit is small, the impact is small, we just want to say, well, who wants to bother with it? And the message of this parable is when it's small and even when it's difficult, it's important to God. And don't buy the devil's lies because this, this parable as well is going to be a Holy Spirit emphasis in the end time church that what is small but is faithful to God is valuable to God and it will be seen to be have a great reward in the age to come. So you put the four parables together and I just leave you with the notes on that because you think, okay, the four, I don't have them all yet. I want to encourage you just to see the four as one continuum of a message preparing the church in the face of what's coming. So let's look at the one that we're really focused on tonight, the third parable, Roman numeral three. It's the parable of the ten virgins. Now the parable of, of the ten virgins is to prioritize staying connected with God's heart. Because the parable before, the issue was don't yield to bitterness and become the evil leader, but stay true and be the faithful, diligent, wise one. But now that you've chosen that path, you got to choose yet more issues to maintain that place before the Lord. And it's this idea of oil of staying connected. Well, let's read it. Verse Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 and 2. Now, I want you to notice four important words in verse 1. He says, then, that's the first important word, the kingdom of God will be comparable or likened to ten virgins. 
they all took lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. Now they all started wise. They started, they were the group from the parable before. They all are virgins, paragraph B. So in this parable, they're all born again believers. And we looked at this last week in, in 2 Corinthians 11, that one of the glorious truths of the gospel is that no matter how much sin and defilement we've walked in, Jesus gives us his own righteousness as a free gift, and he views us in his sight by his own righteousness as chaste virgins before him. It's the most marvelous new beginning and the grace of God and the gift of righteousness is something that keeps us confident in his presence. Day by day, he views us as chaste virgins, even in our brokenness and weakness. This is a remarkable insight, I, I, I mean, a, a, a remarkable fruit of, uh, of Jesus' death on the cross. So first, all 10 of these are born-again believers. That's the part I want you to get. They're 10 virgins. Number two, paragraph C, they all had lamps. Now a lamp meant they were bringing light to other people. The lamp meant they were carrying it on the dark path. They were bringing lights to others. So they all had functional ministries. So they're born again believers and they've got a light shining ministry, 10 for 10. Things are good. The, third, the paragraph D, the next word, they went out to meet the bridegroom. All 10 of them had introductory understanding of Jesus the bridegroom. All 10 of them went to the bridegroom conference. They took the bridegroom class. They wrote bridegroom blogs. They sang bridegroom songs. They all went to meet 10 for 10. Because the tragedy of the story is it that they were completely uninformed? They were actually in the flow and they got out of the flow. That's the tragedy that he's warning them in this song. I mean, in this uh, 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 passage here. Again, this is the third parable. Going back to the second parable, the issue would how would they face disappointment, setbacks? Would they be bitter or would they be faithful and diligent? They chose diligent. Now he says, now I've got another thing before you. Will you stay connected, not just diligent? Because there's a lot of really good people in the body of Christ. They're really diligent, but their ministry activity and their ministry influence outgrows their heart connect. And their hearts get broken and dulled and injured in the process because what they do externally is greater than what they're experiencing internally. And, and we're gonna find out in a moment. He's saying, don't let your ministry activity and your sphere and your open doors of ministry get larger than your heart connect. And when it does, draw back, strengthen your heart. I didn't mean stop everything, but draw back on some of your activity, strengthen the heart connect, and then go forward again. Now, it's interesting, paragraph E, he uses the word then. Look at verse one up in paragraph A. I, just to look at the verse, it says, then the kingdom will be. And the question is, when is then? What do you mean then? Well, this is an end time passage. That's why it's important when you read chapter 25, verse one, then, then points back to the chapter before the whole end time scenario and the signs of the times and the great revival, the gospel of the kingdom to all nations and the persecution and the tribulation and all of these things. The then, Jesus says, when all of those things are happening, then the kingdom will be like believers encountering the bridegroom God. Now for 2,000 years, the kingdom hasn't been like believers encountering the bridegroom God. The kingdom has been believers encountering the Savior, believers encountering the healer, believers encount encountering the king with some power and provision. But over 2,000 years of history, the Spirit has never emphasized Jesus as a bridegroom. I mean, a little group, a group here and there has seen that over the years, but it's never been universally emphasized till the generation of the Lord returns. 
So he goes, then the kingdom will have a bridegroom emphasis at that hour of history. And that is yet ahead of us, but what I believe we're in the early days, and this bridegroom emphasis that is only for one generation is beginning to emerge and become rec uh, recognizable around the world. 10 and 20 and 30 years ago, because I was looking for it 30 years ago, I was wanting to understand the bride of Christ. It was 1988 when the Lord first spoke to me about the bride of Christ, and I didn't like the subject, I didn't like the idea, and he, and he spoke strongly to engage in it, and my real fleshly answer is, I don't want to. I mean, I will, but I'd rather do Life of David, Life of Paul, Book of Acts, you know, Book of Romans, that stuff. I, I don't want to do this other stuff. And I started searching around the earth with my research team. I've told the story before. I, I couldn't hardly find any information on the Bride of Christ. And I was a little bit despairing. I thought, well, how am I going to, I don't know anything about it. And I'm not even that interested, to be honest, Lord. But you made it so clear, I'm going to go ahead and do it because you're going to win this one anyway, so I might as well just go for it. But 30 years ago, I couldn't hardly find anything. And I've been watching carefully, and in the last 10 years, I mean, there's a recognizable beginning, the emergence of a global emphasis of the Spirit on this topic. Jesus, yes, Savior forever. Healer, yes, King forever. Fantastic. He never is not those. But there's a new dimension, the bridegroom. Because we see here in Revelation 22, the only time in history right before Jesus returns, the church will see herself as a cherished bride before a beautiful bridegroom. First time ever in history is in the generation the Lord returns. But the reason, because the last revival will not just be a large one, reach the only time a revival reached every nation, first time ever, it was its scope, its numbers, scope, every nation, numbers, a billion plus, I'm convinced. But the end time revival will be more than that. It will be a bridegroom revival, not just a souls getting saved, bodies getting healed revival. That will be happening beyond any time of history. But there's another storyline that is unfolding. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to raise up messengers you know, the many ways that messengers give the message. Some will do it through social media. Some will do it through song. Some will do it through blogs. Some will do teaching. One-on-one -on -one disciple, discipleship, raising children and teaching them in the home. All of those are part of the messenger ministry. There's many, many ways the messengers. But the, the unique thing about the end time revival is that the messengers have to be established experientially in the reality of the bridegroom God because it's a bridegroom revival. And so it's not enough to say you can get your sins forgiven. I mean, that, again, is a message that is glorious and, and uh, uh, in itself and is never less than that. But when the, where we're going, the Spirit says, no, I want you to bring them past forgiveness into this interchange with the Savior as the bridegroom king because it's a bridegroom revival, not just a normal revival of the last 2,000 years of church history. Because the goal of the end revival is to produce a ready bride. And that's the key word. Jesus uses it twice here in Matthew 24 and 25. And then he uses it at the marriage supper of the Lamb. They are ready. And they are ready to be equally yoked in love is what the ready means. doesn't mean they just didn't lose their salvation and, you know, died and still were saved. They're equally yoked in love. Jesus is coming back for an equally yoked bride that's his partner, not somebody that is on the very edges of the kingdom that, you know, by the grace of God, he goes, well, you still made it. Well, praise God, at least I was ready. No, that's not what ready means. Top of page three. So in this parable... This is why I, I take this parable very, very seriously. He's warning, paragraph A, that the wise, though they have been faced with bitterness and they're not going to respond and become the evil one of the parable before. They've settled that. They're not going that direction. But the next challenge is the wise can become foolish. 
Because remember, all 10 of them had ministries and they were encountering the bridegroom. All of them started in the right place. But five of them neglected to keep the active interchange of their heart with the bridegroom and they lost the oil. Five kept the interaction and five lost it. They presumed on their past experiences and said, hey, you know, I know all this, I'm good. But their heart is no longer moving in the same tenderness it did a year ago or five years ago. And many believers, when that happens, they, net, they don't stop to recognize it. That is a spiritual crisis of a great magnitude. But if not understood, it's a greater, I mean, then it becomes a crisis of great magnitude if it's not understood is what I'm trying to say. Well, let's read verse 2. Five of these ten messengers, these are leaders in the kingdom. They're messengers, I, you know, different spheres of leadership. They have lamps. They have ministries they're bringing to other people. Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. And in verse 3 and 4, this is so profoundly simple. But as the preacher said, simply profound as well. Jesus defines wisdom in the most simple, direct way. And he's talking to the end time ministries in the face of a global climate of trouble, lust, persecution, martyrdom, demon activity, but also in a church environment of the greatest revival in history, he's talking to people in that hour, and he says, let me tell you people, alive then, here's the issue. If you cultivate oil, you're wise. If you don't cultivate, cultivate oil, you got everything else, you're foolish. Simple, there it is. He didn't talk about how educated, how much money they had, how well their networking was, how good their social media savvy was. He said, you get oil, you're wise. You get so busy, you lose your oil, you're foolish. You're still saved, but you're foolish. But even there, it can progress to a very dangerous spot before uh, beyond that, but that's, we'll get to that in a few moments. He said, look at verse three. The foolish took their lamps. Their ministries. But they didn't take oil. They said, I got my ministry in front of me. And the Lord might say, hey, what about the oil? I'm good. The doors are opening. My ministry's in front of me. I got my lamp. But I'm not really focused on the oil. But verse 4, the other five, the wise ones, they said, no, we want oil to be our focus first. And then we're going to take our lamp. They didn't throw their lamps away. But they said, we're going to prioritize oil, and that's what his definition of wisdom is. Paragraph B. Now, oil, in this parable, is real simple. It just speaks of the presence of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, flowing in them and through them. But it's not just God flowing through you in power so people are touched in ministry. He's moving your heart, is what he's talking about. In this particular parable, the oil is really uh, connected with the heart being moved and tenderized. Paragraph C. I just give you four phrases. You could put 10 or 20 of them here just to kind of give you a, a sense of what the oil means. The oil means when our heart is tenderized by the Spirit. I don't mean all day, every day, but those moments when we have tenderizing. The oil speaks of our our. Desire for the Lord is enlarging. Maybe not dramatically, but little by little. And sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps backwards, but the needle's moving forward. It's not just a steady, you know, upward progression. It doesn't always work that way, but when you look back over the months and the years, your desire is enlarging. Number three, your understanding is growing. Number four, your zeal. To be obedient in private is growing. And again, you could put 10 more lines on that. I mean, definitions of that. But the oil in this isn't the oil of power. When I lay hands on the sick and the guy raises from the dead, that's ministry, and that's good. That's awesome. But this oil here, he's talking about a heart connection, a heart tenderizing. You know, when, when I look at this uh, uh, paragraph D, well, let's look at paragraph D. I've already said this, but it kind of just says it again. The foolish, they took their lamp, but they didn't take oil. 
they, this describes the ministry. They, they were virgins, they had lamps, and they had a good beginning with the bridegroom. I mean, they were not uninformed, and they were not without any experience at all. They had initial fundamental introductory experience with intimacy with God. But they pursued more ministry activity before acquiring the oil of, of, of uh, intimacy. And like I said before, when our ministry activity or our sphere of influence gets bigger than our heart engagement, we're going down the wrong path. I must say that again. When our sphere of influence, because the problem or the challenge is a better way to say it, when the anointing of the Spirit or the favor of God's touching you, doors open. But if you go through all the doors, your influence gets bigger than your heart engagement, then you start actually losing the oil. It's a really uh, interesting paradox. The more favor, the more open doors, the more open doors, the more likely you're gonna lose oil. I'll tell a, a very personal example. The Lord spoke this verse to me, and I'm, I'm so grateful. It's, it's kind of weird to share it because I'm kind of the hero of my story here. But it's so dear to me, and I just want, forget my part of it. I want a couple of you out there to go, hey, I'm going to do that. It was in 1988 when the Lord, in a surprising way, took me in my ministry here and set me with one of the most prominent ministries in the Western world, John Wimber. Had thousands of people, uh, seven, six, seven, eight thousand leaders at his conferences and and he invited me to travel with him around the world to every meeting. I mean, 99, 98% of them, I probably missed one I don't know about, but, and he's, through a certain way, met me. I'm about in early 30s. He goes, the Lord showed me you're supposed to go with me, and I stood with him on the main platform to the largest conferences of leaders all around the world. I mean, many countries. Well, Europe and Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, you know, just all over everywhere. And thousands of leaders. And he said, the Lord told me where to do this. And for three years, I was invited to every single conference. He probably went to one or two or three every single month. It, I mean, it was, it was exciting, wearisome. And I remember at the three-year mark, I remember when I was sitting in the van in Denver, Colorado, and I was so grieved in my heart. And the Holy Spirit gave me this word. It saved my life. I didn't really grasp it. Matthew chapter uh, 25, verse 3, he goes, you are becoming the foolish one that has no oil. And the Lord began to confront me. When's the last time you wept in your private prayer time just over the word? Because that would happen, I don't want to exaggerate it, but not every day, but almost every day for a couple of years before that. I would have moments of tenderness where I would experience the love of God. Not every day, but most days. It, it really did happen, and that was my memory. But it hadn't happened for some months. And he brings this to me and says, when's the last time your heart was tenderized? When's the last time you opened a Bible in private and shed tears of love for me? And I was in this van and, and I said, months. I, I don't, my heart's not moved like it was. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know it. I was having such fun and it was enjoyable, it was invigorating, interesting, great people. I hadn't thought about it, which is I'm humiliated, I'm embarrassed to say, and the Lord spoke it to me. So John, I remember he gets in the van, I go, John, I looked, I said, I, I gotta tell you something. He goes, yeah, sure, I go, I, I wanna be released from all of our future conferences. He goes, okay, it's a little bit random, where did that come from? And because I was in the pain of feeling this stinging rebuke from the Lord, this private thing, that I didn't measure my words very good, I, I looked at him, I go, I'm, I'm in the throes of pain. And so I go, John, I'm backslidden. And what he thinks I, I'm saying is I'm involved in some scandal. He goes, oh my God, what did you do? I go, no, no, it's not what I did, it's what I'm not doing. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, John, I, I'm seriously backslidden. And I was. I said, I haven't felt my heart tenderized in a prayer meeting in months. I said, I haven't wept over the word. That sounds so righteous and da-da-da-da. I realize that. It's kind of like it's a weird story to tell. And he looked at me and he goes, oh. He goes, oh, that's, oh, that's neat. I go, no, 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 no. No, I'm not talking about being neat right now. 
I am in trouble with God. And if I stay in this path, it will be bad in a year or two or three. And he goes, well, I really respect that. And he goes, I, I free you. And I just canceled every one of my conferences. I had many more planned for the next year all around the world. And I went back home. And my leadership team said, what happened? Did you guys get in a fight? I go, no, no. I said, I'm backslidden. And I said, but so are you guys, to be totally honest. <laughs> I go, no, really, really. If, if, if it means when we get quiet before the Lord and our heart doesn't move, that's what backslidden looks like to me. I go, I don't want to live that way. And I didn't realize, not that this is the biggest point, that my whole uh, involvement in IHOP in the future was in the balance on that decision. When I look back later, I go, huh. Because Not that IHOP is the big point, but it's like I didn't even really think much about IHOP in 91. But it's like the Lord was saying, if you didn't get back in the right trajectory, you could never, ever it, it would be an endurance. IHOP would be endurance. It would be painful to sit before God unmoved day by day. And I know some people do it. They sit in their prayer room and it's like torture to them because their heart's not moved. There's not a spark of revelation about the Lord. There's no tenderness. And they like the music, but they're going, this is torture. I say, hang in there. It will lift. It will turn around. So I look at this verse and it's, quite personal to me, and I I'm only tell the story. I'm not trying to be some great guy in the story, but I want someone out there to go sometime in the future, you know what? That's where I'm living. I'm in that same place. I just never called it backslidden, and I never thought of it as being rebuked. And the Lord was rebuking me, but tenderly. He was rebuking me to woo me, because he says, I love you. But you're off right now. You have to get back. Paragraph E. The wise, they took their oil first and their lamp second, when you read verse 4 carefully. They made it the first priority. Now, I want to be honest about it, that since 1991, I've lost my way several times since then, but in smaller measures, praise the Lord. But I have. And the Lord has... But back in that van, in that day, in 19, June 91, I remember I set my heart. I said, Lord, if you will whisper this to me, I'll try to respond quickly. And probably every, I don't know, every year or two, or I don't really know the, the amount, but I find myself overly involved in the leadership dimension of ministry and my heart getting dull. And I've experienced that quite a few times since 91, and I go, I am never going to get to the place I was in 91 by the grace of God. I'm going to put the brakes on, shut some things off, turn, turn some opportunities away. Because the, the longer I stay in ministry, like many that, I mean, I'm in my 60s, I just have way more open doors in my 60s than my 30s. That's just how life works, I, I think, for most people. If you do it long enough, but the open doors become the very challenge. Some of them you go through. But the Lord is saying, I want you to weigh every open door through the lens of oil on your heart. Plus a few other things. I don't want to go into all that, but paragraph one under E, Jesus connects being wise, I've already said this, to taking time to encounter the bridegroom. That is such a simple statement, but it's such a radical one. If you will take this at face value, that you will evaluate, not just, I'm taking ministry, whether it's business opportunities, networking opportunities, ways that expand your sphere of influence. If you would look at them and say, thank you, Lord, for your favor, but I'm gonna decide them through the lens of the amount of oil in my heart, it will change your decision-making mechanisms. I wanna challenge you, and some of you already do that. Paragraph five. Verse 5, just continuing in the, par in the parable, verse 5, while the bridegroom delayed, of course, church history, it's 2,000 years plus, they all slept. But verse 6, at the midnight hour of history, the cry is heard, behold, 
The bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Verse 7, all the virgins rose and they trimmed their lamps. They cut the charred top off of the, uh, of the wick because it affects how the, the, the lamp works. It's a standard thing they would do. But I want you to notice, notice there's a threefold cry at the midnight hour of history. Now I'm adding the midnight hour of history because the whole Matthew 24 and 25 is about the end times according to Jesus. So I'm taking the liberty to add at midnight of the parable because it is the midnight hour in context that Jesus is talking to, the end times, the generation of his return. There's a threefold cry in verse 6. The cry was heard. First, he's coming. There's a cry going out in the earth, and it's, you hear it more and more in the last 10 years than the 10 years before it. It's the beginning. It's a faint cry, but the cry is building in the nations. He's coming. And the he's coming, he's coming in two ways. First, he's coming in waves of revival that are renewing the church and winning the lost. Then he's going to come in the sky in, in flaming fire in the glory of God. He's coming first in waves of revival that are intensifying. But beloved, the waves of revival is not the normal Charles Finney, first, second great awakening of history where just, you know, thousands get saved and that's the end of it. No, this is a bridegroom revival. It's the multitude saved, but they're brought into spiritual depth in a way unique any time in history. He's coming. The, the waves of revival are beginning to break out across the world. And you're hearing the sound of prophetic voices proclaiming, get ready, get ready, he's coming. But paragraph uh, C, there's another message. It's not only he is coming, the one that's coming is a bridegroom. He's not just a king with power. He's coming, and he wants this mutually yoked, equally yoked heart. He's a bridegroom who wants a loyal bride. He has intense desire, but he demands a response. That's the one who's coming. He's not coming to stamp our passports so a billion people go to heaven when they die, and that's the storyline. He's coming as a God of intense desire for wholeheartedness. He's giving his all. He's requiring his all. He's not just coming. It's a bridegroom who's coming is the second part of the message. But the third part of the message, paragraph D, go out to meet him. And that's what I'm talking about right now. Go out to meet him means shift your lifestyle and your schedule so you have time to interact with him because you're not going to get oil on the run. We get oil. It's very intentional and deliberate. Get up and begin to engage him, meaning get up, step away from the business as usual lifestyle. I love the testimony of the Mary of Bethany to earlier. Become a, a dimension of your life intentional about the Mary of Bethany interchange. Go out and meet him. This is not a ministry activity. This is arising from your business as usual life to interact with him, taking your own initiative to do that. Paragraph E, it says they all slept. Look at verse 5, that while the bridegroom delayed, they all slept. Now, sleeping in this parable is not bad. Sleeping in other parables means they're spiritually sleeping. It's not bad because the good, the wise, and the foolish were sleeping. The sleeping here is talking about cultivating the oil in context of the natural processes of life, meaning that we've got to, uh, there's a rhythm of life. There's a dimension of the natural dimensions of life that has a certain rigor to it, that has a certain routine to it, that has a certain mundaneness to just everyday life. He says, you're going to get oil, but in that context. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, cause the human processes to be all lifted. I'm not going to take you out of the realm of humanity because these wise ones even had the natural processes of life that they were engaged in. But in the midst of that, in the rigors and the routines, the wise ones determined to get oil. Top of page four. Verse eight. Verse eight. 
the foolish, now the foolish started good. They knew better than to get in this condition. But the tragedy is that they wake up too late and they do suffer loss. And that's the reference I made back in Matthew 24, verse 43. I talk about the thief. The thief doesn't just come suddenly. The thief comes to cause you to suffer loss. These five foolish ones suffered loss. You'll see here in verse 8. The wise said to the, the foolish said to the wise, hey, can you give us your oil? Our ministries are diminishing. Our light is going out. Can you give us your oil? Verse 9, and the wise virgins answered, no, it doesn't work that way. Go into the God-ordained processes and acquire your own oils, what they're saying here. He says, go and buy your own oil. Now let's look at paragraph A for a moment here. The foolish ministries recognized the great mistake that they neglected oil while they were running in their ministries. Now, men and women have done that all through history. They have neglected oil all through history. But in the bridegroom revival, where spiritual depth is the center theme of that revival. You want to be a voice, not an echo. You want to call people into an interaction with a bridegroom God because you have an interaction. You won't be able to memorize a little paragraph or a song and then it works because bringing people into a greater understanding and encounter of the bridegroom means that you're doing it in your private life. Like the, like the phrase that the Lord gave me some years ago, I want you to be a voice, not an echo. Don't just echo concepts. You gotta have something in your private history you're interacting with and you're talking out of it. You're not giving memorized little statements. You're giving heartfelt movements of your interaction with the bridegroom. A lot of ministry lamps. As we get closer to the Lord's return, the darkness is gonna get darker, the occult activity the lust and perversion of the internet pornography, perversion where it's going in the next 20, 30 years is unthinkable. The persecution, the rage against the church, the outpouring of the Spirit, all of these things are mounting up. And I, and I mean, this is obvious, that it, it's going to require spiritual vitality to thrive as an individual, but to thrive as a messenger as well. And I don't mean having a big crowd. That's not what thriving means. Is you might, your, your influence may be three people, but you're moving them to God when you talk to them. I'm not talking about the size of your influence. I'm talking about the depth of the movement of their heart because you've touched them and the Holy Spirit's used you. This is a self-evident thing, but I just want to say it. Paragraph A, Christian self-help, pop psychology sermons are not going to meet meet the need of the hour of a demonized culture with persecution and martyrdom and lust at a whole nother level, just kind of pop psychology, gee whiz, things are gonna get better. That's never going to meet the need of the crisis of the nations. And many in the body of Christ will say, you know what, I appreciate that back when, but now that just has nothing, that is nothing for me right now. I've got to know how to touch God right now. There, there's, a new, there's a new story developing in the earth, and I need to be a part of that. And I love your little popular little pop psychology stuff, but it's not helping me right now. Those lamps, I want to just prophesy to you, they're going out. And, and I, I'm not against any of them. I'm just saying is the, the depth of darkness and the pain and the cry for reality is going to be so much greater in the decades coming than in the decades in the past. Paragraph B, they said, give us your oil. In other words, hey, could you bolster our ministry a little bit? Hey, why don't we join together? Hey, let's partner, and we'll use your oil, and we'll build the crowd back up. And the wise, paragraph B said, no. They understood their limitation. They said, I cannot give you my spiritual history. 
our spiritual preparation is not transferable. I mean, I believe in laying hands on people and people getting something in the grace of God, but I can't get somebody else's spiritual history. It's day by day, conversation by conversation with the Lord. They go, no, you gotta buy oil, paragraph C, and that sounds like an odd word, buy, because we think of earn it, and Jesus understands the grace of God really well. That's not what, he wasn't confused. He was using popular language, and he used the same language in the book of Revelation. He said, go buy gold. He didn't mean earn it. He meant invest your way, yourself, in the God-ordained way, but in a costly investment. Throw yourself into it all the way. Don't stand on the edges and wonder where it's at. Jump in all the way is what it's saying. Paragraph D. And while they went to buy these five foolish virgins, they, they go, we gotta go get some oil now. While they're coming, this is a great tragedy. While they're trying to build a history in God, they're trying to get the oil they should have been getting for years before, the bridegroom comes. Now again, in the analogy of the, I, I think the application is parable, he comes in waves of revival first that are increasing, then he comes in the sky in, in fire at the second coming. And I believe this has both applications to it. Look at verse 10, there's those, that fantastic phrase. I can't fathom anything more important than this. And those who were ready. Beloved, that's not only the number one goal of your personal life, to be responsive, a full responsiveness to God. That's not only your personal goal, that's God's goal for human history for the end of history, the redeemed would stand ready at the marriage supper of the Lamb, responsive in this mutual, wholehearted love, equally yoked dimension love to the Lord, this responsiveness. Well, the five that were ready, I just can't think of anything more important than that. I want you to take that phrase, those are ready, put your name on it, say, this is my new life goal right here. I am going to be responsive. I'm not going to be in the hour. Even when the revivals begin to increase, a lot of folks say, well, when the revivals all increase, I'll just get in the flow. And the Lord says, yeah, but I would have liked you to be a vessel to impart bridegroom revelation, but you never inter interacted with it. And it's a bridegroom revival. This is the bridegroom generation. This isn't the hour to be disconnected to this reality because the revival, the ultimate one coming that the Lord returns at the back, at the end of it, is a bridegroom revival of radical first commandment and first place kind of interaction. So he went in. These five went in with him, verse 10. And they're celebrating the wedding. And again, whether they're celebrating it in the revival, the waves of revival, building up to the final wedding, the kind of the pre-celebration of it before that last day, I think it, it, you can apply it both days. And then the door was shut. The door of opportunity to participate was shut. Verse 11, the five foolish ones, they came and go, hey, hey, wait, remember verse one? We used to have, go out and meet you. We know the bridegroom. We went to that conference. We taught the class. Are you kidding? We know this. Open up the door of opportunity. Use me in the great bridegroom revival. Or allow me at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Those are two different applications that, that are quite different from each other, but I think both of them have a relevant application here. In verse 12, he says, No, I don't know you in the bridegroom revelation. I don't, we don't talk this language. You don't refer to me. We don't have a history in this, and that's what I'm releasing in the earth right now. Yes, you can receive from others, but I would have that you would have been one imparting it, not only, oh, because you always want to be receiving it, but I would have had it that you would have been imparting it and had a history ready to speak out of the overflow of your life and not here devoid of oil in the great hour when I'm shifting history. Paragraph E, the bridegroom came. I'm saying it again, but I just want you to get it, and I'll bring this to a close in just a moment here because I want you to get the worship team, get ready to come on up, is that uh, the bridegroom came. Again, there's the waves of revival. 
that are crescendoing and getting bigger and bigger. We're just at the very beginning of that, but we're going to look in the decades ahead, these revival waves, but they're going to be bridegroom-centered revivals, not just get saved and then go on your, with your life business as usual. Now, it was typical, paragraph one and two here, it was typical in the ancient world for a wedding feast to con continue for seven nights. You know, in the West, we have the wedding, and then an hour later, you have the one or two or three or hour, whatever you do, afterwards. But in the ancient world, they had the wedding, and they would have night one, a feast, night two, a feast, night three, a feast. So in the first night, the closest ones to the bride and bridegroom were invited. And so the first evening, the door is shut. The door is shut. He goes, I don't know you this way. I don't know you this way. Evening number two, wave number two, wave number three. I mean, there's, again, the analogy. There were seven nights. I don't want to overdo the details of the analogy here. But I think there's going to be multiple building, crescendoing opportunities. But I want to be in whatever wave is happening in my generation. Paragraph, I'm going to end with paragraph F here. He says, I don't know you. I believe there's two applications to this. The first one is the loss of usefulness in the revivals that I've been referring to most. But the second application is the loss of salvation. Look at number two. I think it's, I mean, because people debate, is this loss of salvation or loss of opportunity to be used in that hour of history as a voice because they're not just an echo of voice and I think it could be both because I think that the darkness and the intensity that increases that without an active increase of intimacy if we're not going forward over the years people regress and I think some could actually back all the way and regress to where they're completely out of it entirely and so I, I, I see the theological point of views of this. I don't know. You think, well, which is it? I said, I think it could be both. Because I've seen on-fire believers get bitter, and over uh, five years and ten years, they deny the faith. The trajectory of negativity takes over, and they don't even want the Lord at the end. And I think in the environment of hostility and darkness, if we're not moving forward, I understand why this really could be not just loss of opportunity. That's enough. That's tragic enough for me. It could be loss of salvation. And Jesus ends with his advice again, paragraph A. He goes, watch. He goes, watch and pray. He goes, if you do that, it's so easy. Everyone can do it. It's so simple that so many don't do it. And he gives the same exhortation literally in every end time passage. Watch and pray. This is the way to stay up to pace with what the Lord's doing in your life. Well, amen and amen. Let's stand before the Lord.